Hello and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce Odyssey podcast. I'm here with, with Dim from 3Commerce and we're going to talk about how to use NFTs to drive your e-commerce sales, which is a bit different. We haven't talked about NFTs before. So Dim, first off, what are NFTs? Hey, Trevor, thanks for having me. Um, Okay, so what are NFTs? I'll describe or outline this kind of in a non-e-commerce context just so that you can guys understand yeah. what it is and then we can tie it back into e-commerce and actually make it all relevant. Um, so essentially what an NFT is or what it stands for is a non-fungible token, which means, I mean, in the crypto space and on the blockchain, you've got two different types of tokens. You've got your coins like Bitcoin, where there are 20, 21 million of them and they're all the same. And then the other kind of version that you have is a non-fungible token, which means it's irreplaceable and it's unique. So that is essentially, if you just think about it as a file of some form that's on the blockchain, um, it can be an image, it can be a video, it can be a pass, it can be a piece of music, a piece of art, whatever it might be. But it's actually, instead of sitting as a file on your computer, it's sitting up on the blockchain. So we can actually see who owns that NFT. Um, we can transfer it between each other. We cannot replicate it, which makes it quite unique. Um, but in a, a very short kind of nutshell, it's essentially just a file that represents something on the blockchain that can't be replicated and is unique. Okay. So when it comes to e-commerce right yeah. um and nfts in that space what a lot of people are doing is essentially using these nfts as access passes to gain access to either a community of some sort to some certain benefits um, perhaps it's special pieces of content whatever it might be where you know a brand or a company will issue a pass and then the customer that buys that pass can then use it to gain access to these these benefits or these this utility that that sits behind the nft Okay, so is it the same kind of thing that you'd use in, I mean, I haven't heard of people doing this, but, you know, for issuing, say, tickets for concerts or something like that? Yeah, exactly. And I think that a lot of, especially the crypto crypto native sort of conferences now are pretty much all switching over to using NFTs as their ticketing systems, right? Um, because then, for example, if I buy one of these NFTs, which is my access pass to crypto convention 2023, whatever it might be, and I decide that I don't want to go, I can simply just transfer it to whoever I want to sell it to, right? Um, some of the really cool things that we can do with it, though, is because it's a digital asset and it's written on the blockchain in code, uh, we can actually write in the code that the original issuer, right? So the people running the convention, when they sell, when a customer buys an NFT and then sells it on to another customer, the original issuer can take 5%, 10%, whatever cut back, right? So then they're continuing to make money on an ongoing basis based on the resell of their items. And this kind of ties back into e-commerce as well, because if we actually tie nfts to our products as say certificates of authenticity so if you think about rolex or supreme or any of these big brands that have big secondary resale markets they obviously have an initial kind of revenue that comes from the initial sale but there's a massive secondary sales volume or secondary sales market that they never get to see a piece of revenue from mm -hmm. so if we tie NFTs to this right as certificates of authenticity when john sells his you know yeezy sneakers to mary then Adidas will then take a cut from that as well, which in encourages and incentivizes them to make sure that the secondary resale experience is a really smooth one for the customers as well. So it kind of creates a win-win. The brands are getting a piece out of that secondary market and they're incentivized to create a better experience for their customers. But surely, I mean, just specifically talking about that, um, you know, it would, that sounds like it's good for the brand, but not so good for the person who owns it. So you're saying in a way that the person would not fully own the product that they have under those same circumstances. They wouldn't fully own the product. Well, that they have. I mean, if I buy something, if I buy a Rolex, right? See my two Rolexes I'm wearing. Um, the you know I would want you know that that belongs to me, right? And I don't really want if I sell it, I don't want to have to give a cut to Rolex, you know. But it's it's a bit like um, so you know it's the problem the kind of difference between kind of physical assets and something which is you know like a uh, which you know like like a record. I mean, when you bought a, a piece of music in the past, you owned that 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 record, and it was something you could then sell on physically. You gave it to someone, right? Mm. But now you've got like a you know a piece of um, you know a download from iTunes or something like that. You don't re you know you don't own that in the same way. It doesn't have any value that you can sell on. So it seemed to me if Rolex, if someone like Rolex or Adidas want to get a, a, a cut from future sales then you know i would as as the owner i mean they can they impose that on the on the the owner of the well, item yeah so not necessarily i mean it, it all comes down to the inherent value that this kind of ecosystem creates for the customer so when you're buying a rolex now currently you don't really know if that rolex is legit or not if you're going to pay twenty thousand dollars for a rolex and you're just getting a piece of paper with it or more often than not 
they're not even sold with their certificates of authenticity because they've been lost over the years or whatever it might yeah. be. If we put that on the on the blockchain, sure, you might be paying a 5% premium or a 2% premium or whatever it might be, but it completely solves the problem of, of fraud and um, like it's essentially a mechanism for fraud prevent, prevention, which protects the customers. So how would you do that? Okay, so you've got a physical item like a, a Rolex and let's just say it's a new Rolex because that's probably easier. Would you have like a code on the back of the Rolex or how would you how would you say, obviously you've got an NFT, which is one thing and you've got the physical item, which is another. How do you link the two? Yeah, so um, obviously there's software that is currently being developed to kind of help facilitate this process and it's still very, very early days. There's a company called ShopX um, and they're doing a lot of this work at the moment um, and their plan is to essentially have inside like the clothing tags of clothes and on the inside of shoes and stuff to have a QR code that then links into the software so that when you do sell the shoe or whatever it might be or you want to make sure that the shoe is a, a real version, you scan the QR code and it'll show you a transaction on the blockchain. Um, and being on the blockchain, it's immutable, which means it can't be changed or altered, right? Mm -hmm. So then you've got absolute certainty that it works, yeah. Okay, because it's a big problem. If you take something like I mean, a lot of these people, um, a lot of these brands, it's like Hermes or someone like that, they don't really like, because I, I do a lot of selling on eBay and Amazon and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even though there's a, there's a bit of a, a lot of unresolved problems in e-commerce, which I get, you know, and one mm -hmm. of them is people's ability to resell items they own. So if you have a, you know, something like a, you know, a Hermes watch or something, you know, a Hermes product, they really don't like those things being resold on secondary markets on particularly on eBay and mm -hmm. you know, people. And so they will try and pull all of these listings oh, wow. yeah, and okay. um, because they'll say, oh, it's a fake. And it's very hard, you know, to show that it's not a fake. And mm -hmm. I don't know at which point, I mean, the, the, the there's a real kind of a real, a real kind of conflict between you know people's rights to sell an item wherever they want to sell that item and the brands trying to control that so i wonder what do you I mean is this going to improve that or not well i mean it, if you, like this hermes example that you're um kind of painting the picture of if they're concerned that it's a fake and we've got that verified on the blockchain with that certificate of authenticity that's represented as an nft then there'll be no doubt in the customer's mind or the brand's mind that that specific piece that's getting sold is actually a genuine piece that came from hermes right yeah. and a bit, because they're getting a, a small cut for making sure that this pro process all happens and is facilitated smoothly, um, they're rewarded as well as the customers obviously get much greater but, sense of peace of mind. I mean, but would this be a? I mean, will this be a, a a mechanism for brands to charge more money? Because you know, with the example we were talking about earlier, I was saying about you know the the the, the whole in art, there's this whole concept of authenticity. So you know, you have a, you know, if you've got a. Um, Someone says a painting is a Leonardo, right? And if it's if it's someone, you know, some artist comes along and some some uh, you know quote unquote expert comes along and says that's a Leonardo, and then it becomes worth almost unlimited amount of money. But if someone other expert comes along and says it's a you know it's a fake or it's not a Leonardo, then it becomes worth next to nothing. And all it is is just you know someone's opinion about something. Or you know another example is one of these you know. Um, uh, you know, Andy Warhol's Campbell soups or something, you know, just because it, these are not just, you know, tins of Campbell soup, they're, they're Andy Warhol's tins of Campbell soup. So the same thing, just because it's got this stamp of approval on it, like an NFT becomes worth more money. So would it be that Adidas will come along and say, look, these are the authentic articles, we can prove it and therefore we want to charge you more money. Will the consumer well, that's, what, that's what they're saying now that, that their pieces are authentic, but they're not necessarily, or they don't necessarily have a mechanism to prove it, right? Yeah. I just so wonder whether it would just be say, you know, you could buy yeah. something with an NFT and they'll charge you ten percent more. You could buy it without an NFT and they'll they'll. I just want to. I just want. Would it be a mechanism for brands to try and extract more money out of consumers? Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess we'll have to wait and see. But um, I mean, that's that's just one use case for yeah, using yeah. NFT commerce. The, the the main problem that we're trying to tackle with three commerce is um using NFTs as a um sort of vehicle or medium to run um, loyalty programs off, right? Yeah. So essentially, let's say that going back to Adidas, let's say you're Adidas and you want to reward your 10,000 most loyal customers. You can issue 10,000 NFTs that go to your most loyal customers, or you can sell those NFTs to the customers, whatever it might be. And um, then the, that that NFT or that pass is essentially used as a ticket to get into the loyalty program and to actually access certain benefits that no other customers can get. And these benefits can include, sorry, go ahead. No, no, just say, what's the benefit of that over a, just, you know, a password or a, a you know, just a yeah, log? Absolutely. So the first one I think is finite supply, right? So we're capping the limit at 10,000. Of course, you, the same question would arise, like why can't we just create 10,000 logins? And you're you're pretty correct with that. But the the nice thing about that is it's actually the the NFT is transferable. So there'll be a secondary market of NFTs that ends up being resold because that ends up um, 
uh, being resold between customers because there is a limited supply, right? And the customers have certainty and confidence because it's, it's backed by the blockchain that we're not going to be creating more NFTs. So the value isn't going to go down. But so uh, my main point being, we create this kind of secondary market that's, that's um, that, that it comes about because of the finite supply. And then customers can sell their membership passes to other customers if they say, you know, they put on a bunch of weight and they're no longer shopping at Nike or Adidas and they're not into the fitness sort of lifestyle anymore. They can actually recover their initial expense by selling it on to another customer. So how does that how does that benefit? Okay, so I'm a brand, I'm Adidas, right? I want to know about my, the benefit of if I have a loyalty program that I want to know who my customers are in the loyalty program, right? Because that's the whole point of having a loyalty program. Yeah. If you've got your customers, if you don't know, if the customers are reselling the loyalty program to other people, so mm. that defeats the point of having a loyalty program. How so? Well. Okay, so I've got a loyalty program, and I know that Dimitri has got is is that member of the loyalty program, right? And I'm yeah. guessing that you know you being South African, you're probably running all day and and yeah. surfing or whatever, yeah. <laughs> right, you know you go, you know you you all of a sudden you know fall off your fall off your bike, break your leg, and then you decide to sell it to to Trevor in St Albans, right? Mm. And then Adidas doesn't know whether it's you or me that is in that loyalty program, and therefore you know how does that benefit Adidas? Well, so then you know, say Trevor wants to come and get benefits off the Adidas website, right? Because they've just, Trevor's just bought the pass. He'll be able to go onto the website, log in with his NFT, and then he'll gain access to those benefits. And yeah. it's the benefits and, and providing that value that is going to actually like, you know, increase the lifetime value of the, of the customer over time. It's kind of like the whole Amazon prime model, right? If they're, yeah. you've got a customer that's bought into a membership program, they're going to be high, uh, more incentivized to come back and continue shopping more but, frequently and to spend but- more. What's the benefit to Adidas over just having a subscription? I mean, because you know, you, if 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 I'm if I'm you know with Prime, right, you just go onto Prime, you pay that money directly to Amazon. Whereas, you know, what's the benefit to Adidas and having customers trading these things between them? Surely, yeah, it would be that's... better for Adidas just to you know the customer go directly to Adidas and just buy that from Adidas. That's a really good question. So going back to the finite supply and the secondary market, right? Because there's a sec- secondary market for these passes and for access into the membership program, it means that obviously there's going to be a floating value over time. So as Adidas grows or provides better f- benefits to their customers, but mainly as, as they grow, the value of the passes will also go up. And so it introduced kind of introduces this economy of ownership where the customers are incentivized because now instead of just being a member of a program, they're almost the part owner in the brand, right? So they're incentivized to run around and tell their friends and family about, you know, hey, you should shop at Adidas, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, they'll be posting on their socials and stuff like that in order to help Adidas grow so that the value of their digital asset goes up and then they essentially make money. And um, doesn't that just imply that, I mean, okay, so some brands, you've got, you know, brands like Adidas, right? That everyone wants to join the, the loyalty programs, right? Adidas, Nike, Apple, whatever. And I could see that it might work for that. But you no, know, because you need in order in order for something to get a value, your market value, it has to be traded frequently. So it has to be a certain amount of liquidity in it, right? And you're only yeah. going to have liquidity for the larger brands. So if yeah, you're a correct. medium-sized brand where you know they're, they're probably, you know, let's say the people are less interested in in this, is that going to work for them or not? It will. You've just got to start off with a much smaller supply, right? So it's obviously going to be relative to the number of customers you have and the demand for a loyalty program, because with loyalty programs in general, it's not really a bit. Loyalty programs are not really a means for customer acquisition. They're more so a means for increased lifetime value and bringing more customers on board. And that generally, you know, these loyalty programs are generally marketed to the existing customers of a brand. So okay. obviously, in order for that to to work, you'll have to have a certain number of customers that have already kind of been through your business and have had an interaction with you. Um, and then, you know, you can tackle loyalty program on top. It's the same with like a, any web two loyalty program or traditional okay. loyalty program. Is this, is this a solution looking for a problem? Sorry to be a bit negative. It could be, it could very well be. I think, um, I think it definitely solves a lot of problems though. I mean, you know, in the e-commerce landscape now we're seeing customer acquisition costs and just generally the cost of marketing skyrocket as well as with, you know, obviously iOS 14 happened. It became a lot more difficult to track our customers and really gain a grasp on um, customer behavior and then you know obviously give them segmented marketing based on that so when customers come on board and they buy one of these passes they're essentially identifying themselves with um, or to your brand and with that as we kind of see this space develop you know you you're going to have your your cryptocurrency wallet that holds this nft is also going to have any um concert tickets as we spoke to before pieces of music whatever it might be. So we can draw a profile on that customer based on what's in their wallet that they share with us when they come to verify the fact that they own an NFT um, yeah. in order to get the benefits from your brand. Because I can see it really working for something if you have a, you know, if you've got a 
you know, there's there's like a concept. There is a, a, a there's a real problem with reselling tickets, and mm. there's a real problem with um, you know of, of you know the, the of these touts buying tickets. And I could see that you know that that uh, they would really work for that. So I think that I mean it would seem that there's. I, I could see that it, you know if Adidas wanted to have something like an event or something like that, then it would really work. I think that that would be you know um, a I could I can see I'm I'm sold on that. That's a, like a really good idea. Um, so tell me, have you got any examples of how this is being used successfully by brands? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think halfway through last year, um, there was a brand called The Hundreds, which is a US based um, clothing brand. Um, and they've been around for 20 odd years now. They released an NFT collection called the Atom Bomb Squad. And they sold 20,000 NFTs, I believe it, it was something like 0.1 Ethereum. Um, so at the time, all of these transactions have, had to happen in crypto because the technology just wasn't or well, isn't there yet um, to kind of facilitate this whole process in a very user-friendly way. So that's what we're building with 3Commerce. We're building tech that actually lets customers just come and do this without having to have um, any cryptocurrency in order to make the purchase or to own their own crypto wallet or anything like that. But I digress. So um, Adam, they released a collection called Adam Bomb Squad that was 20,000 NFTs. And now their brand releases certain clothing colorways or, or designs or patterns that are only accessible to the token holders. And those pretty much sell out right away just because they've, they've created this group or this community of 20,000 super fanatic customers um, that then are going around and they're shopping right away. They've also, a lot of these guys have set their profile pictures on Instagram to their NFTs, which obviously then ties back to the brand and helps the brand grow. Um, and that brand's really positioned themselves as kind of a market leader or an innovator in the space um, and has worked quite well for them. To top, to kind of add to that, their initial NFT sales from that collection was about $10 million. Um, I think I may have mentioned that, um, which is obviously a really great capital raise. And then of course, they're getting the secondary resales commissions that come through okay. as well, which... Um, you know, maybe yeah. I'm just maybe I'm just too old. Maybe I'm just it's like you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like another another example is um uh what's called Reddit now has released yeah. uh, their own NFT collections called avatars and these avatars when the the user of Reddit buys it and like it's a little bit um away from e-commerce but when a user buys it it's between nine and ninety nine dollars they get access to extra communities that other holders can't get access to or that the general users can't get access to um and that was also a, a soaring success so there are use cases out there and the stuff is definitely working um board ape yacht club is another nft collection that kind of did it the other way around so they released their nfts first and then they released a fashion line um alongside the nfts and um, I bought a Board Ape Yacht Club NFT at the end of 2020, I think. Um, and then when they released their apparel about six months ago, they sold out within a couple of hours, you know, just because it's it's become a breeding ground for these really, really fanatic communities and loyal customers to then... How big do you think a community has to be for it to be successful? Well, it's kind of like a, a what comes first, the chicken or the egg kind of situation, right? It's, do you sell the NFTs and then build a community around the NFTs or do you build a community first? And, but if you have a, an e-commerce brand, I would imagine or hope to imagine that you have some kind of, and that with what you do, I mean, retail um, or it's, it's retail, right? Yeah, it's retail, yeah. A little bit different. But when you've got an e-commerce brand that's selling its own own products, they should definitely have some form of community, right? Um, yeah. I think it, it would have to be a considerable size, but it's all relevant to the amount of NFTs you want to sell and how big you want to make this kind of loyalty program, right? If you only have a thousand people in your community, you're not going to want to sell that many kind of premium NFTs. But if you've got a hundred thousand, then you can go for a much bigger number. So all relevant. Okay. So how has the recent, I mean, crypto has not done so well in the last few weeks. Yeah. Is that, is, is that affecting you guys or is just so a for for us, it isn't just because we're kind of building these loyalty programs that are then backed by the blockchain, but the entire, um, user journey and process is requires no knowledge or information about crypto at all. And the way we um, actually recommend selling these passes is not to even call it an NFT, right? To the customers. It's just an access pass. That's yeah. Been it's like a digital asset. Um, so for us, not so much, but a lot of our competitors are struggling just because um, they are selling more typically towards those kind of crypto consumers that already understand and know how it works. And then those guys need to come in with Ethereum or um, Matic or whatever the cryptocurrency that they're going to use to transact with and they need to have their own crypto wallets and that that sort of customer base um, has really obviously shrunk now that the market has also shrunk so again right. for us just because we're trying to solve that that accessibility problem 
we're selling to the general consumer and they don't have to have any knowledge of it. So it's not relevant to the crypto markets at all. Um, but yeah, for others, it's, I can't say the same. Yeah. Well, fungible is one of my favorite words. I love it. I'm it. <laughs> you talk about, uh, I just think it's a great word. So what kind of technology is needed to run this kind of thing? Tell us about your technology. Yeah. Okay. So there are some basic applications out there that can already do it. Um, Shopify is actually leaning very much into this. They've got a whole blog kind of built out now with, um, so if you Google Shopify token gating applications, mm -hmm. you'll be able to get a whole list of the different applications. I can't tell you the names of them off the top of my head. Um, but again, the challenge with a lot of these is that the, you're going to have to educate your customer on how to use cryptocurrency in order to facilitate this process, which I think is not ideal. Um, we're releasing our beta in about three months. And that is going to essentially solve all of those problems. So customers just log in with a username and password and can transact with US dollars or pounds or whatever it is um, and don't need any experience with crypto. So that's that's called 3Commerce. And if you go to 3CommerceProtocol.com, you can check out more and uh, apply for the beta program if you like as well. Okay. So is it difficult? I mean, is it difficult and expensive for you, for brands to do this or? Yeah, at the moment, at the moment, it, it is a little bit difficult. Again, just because... I mean, the one route to go down is educating your customers on how to do it the crypto way, which is not ideal. And I wouldn't recommend because obviously you're going to have a lot of drop off um, just because of that sort of education curve. The other alternative is to build out for yourself what our tool is made to do, which would probably, if you wanted to do it for your brand, would cost well into the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, but if you wait a little bit, we'll have, it's just going to be a Shopify extension or a Shopify, Shopify application that plugs straight into your website and deploys all of this for you. So what's the, what's the future of NFTs? I mean, how would you see it, you know, if you've got, uh, how would you see this developing for e-commerce brands? I mean, what kind of things are they going to be using NFTs for? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the, the two kind of use cases that we've covered are one, you know, provenance and fraud prevention, which is um, tying these certificates of authenticity to your products. And then the other one being the loyalty programs. Another big one is, um, oh, it's just left me. Um, we can create essentially give um, a create like a shop to earn model where customers are paid their loyalty points in a cryptocurrency instead of in just normal loyalty points. And the benefit of that is they can then transfer that out of the ecosystem and of that that is your own brand's website and actually make use of those points elsewhere or just sell them into dollars, which is nice for the customer as opposed to giving them points that are only can only be used on that website. Um, and then finally, and I think a, a pretty significant one is for product launches. So we see kind of Indiegogo and Kickstarter and, and um, platforms like this that essentially e-commerce brands come in with an idea and they do some mock-ups and maybe they create a prototype and then they go and launch that to the market, but they haven't gone through the manufacturing process yet. So you mm -hmm. pre-buy the product and then receive the product in three months, four months, six months time, whatever it might be. Now, if we tie instead of just selling a promise to receive a product, we actually sell an NFT that's representative of that product and then come shipment time, the customer can then redeem that NFT and their product gets shipped to them. Um, that allows for, again, secondary trading in the interim. So let's say you buy a pair of headphones, it's not going to ship for three months. You think, I'll oh, stuff that. I really need a pair of headphones. Now you go and buy your headphones, then we'll also bought this. Now I'm just kind of wasting money when my second lot, lot arrives. Um, you can then just sell that to another customer on the secondary market. Or if you did don't necessarily want to wait for three months or you see that you missed out on the actual product launch itself, but the product's shipping in a week, then you can go and buy it from a customer that that bought it three months ago um, or whatever it might be. So it does provide a lot of benefits just in terms of transferability and, and in particular ownership. You actually own something as opposed to just receiving a, a promise to receive a product. Okay. So it means it gets, gets part of around this, some of these things where you you it's difficult to own digital assets and resell them. Exactly, exactly. You you own your membership into a loyalty program now. You're not simply renting space. Okay, excellent. So, cool. This has been very interesting. Um, I've got one last question for you. What are you nerdy about? I mean, obviously, I think that cryptocurrency and, and blockchains are probably quite nerdy in and of themselves, right? Absolutely. So what are you even nerdy about? What do you do? What are you nerdy about when you're not talking about NFTs? Oh, and I'm not talking about NFTs. Probably boxing. That's something that I've taken up only a couple of years ago, quite recently, I think. Um, and I absolutely love it. I mean, it's it's nice to kind of, once or twice a week, go and get punched Good. in the face a couple of times. <laughs> <to pick laughs> up before getting Dude. behind the desk, you know, definitely yeah. wakes you up. In I don't know if you know, I, I don't know if one of my favorite um, quotes is uh, Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think I've learned a lot about business from boxing as well. Um, and just life in general, you know, for, for that exact reason, it's, it, you've got no idea what's kind of coming and you can't make any mistakes. Otherwise you're going to be, you're going to have to pay for them, you know? And I think, uh, yeah. boxing have you read, good, um, uh, the fight by Norman Mailer? No, no, the I fight, haven't. that's a book, you know, the, um, Muhammad Ali rumble in the jungle. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a book about that. It's a brilliant oh, book. Okay. It's all about you know that the you know because he went to um, Muhammad Ali uh, was fighting George Foreman in um, mm. Manila, not Manila. No, there was Kinshasa, Kinshasa. You know, um, uh, ahead of the um, um, capital of of the Congo, is it um, begins with a I can't remember. Anyway, they he they um, Mobutu paid money for them to go there, and it was the rumble in the jungle and and. Um, uh, Muhammad Ali bought, uh, beat George Foreman and it was Norman Mailer was a big fan of, of boxing and he went to that. And then there was the Thriller in Manila after that. Okay. I'm a bit of a fan of Muhammad Ali. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, very cool. Awesome. One, of the things I, one of the things I know about. So I'd really recommend that book if you're interested in interested in boxing. Right, um, I'll send you a link. Okay, off, fantastic. Off. Cheers. Great. Dimitri, it's been lovely talking to you and I think I've learned, uh, thank you for putting up with my, my questions and uh, I've learned a lot about NFTs. I look Fantastic. forward to it. Maybe we'll catch up in a few years and we'll find out how it's how it's gone. Sounds like a plan. Cheers, okay. Trevor.